Welcome back to From Pain to Gain. I am Ivan. This is my good friend. What have we known each other like four or five years now, JP? Yes, it's been a minute. Yep, I think we met at a networking event. Yeah. And the awesome thing about it, too, we, we talked for what, two minutes? <laughs> and you were like, I'm out. I'm going to go to another networking event because <laughs> you're a hustle mode type guy. And yeah, I think it was, it was pre COVID. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pre-COVID. And out of those two minutes, we became best friends, really. And and we had that lunch or whatever, days after or whatever we met up at. And it's just amazing because I guess I'll just throw that as a tip in there, right? As a If you want to get into real estate, you could make, make an amazing relationship in two minutes flat. So, JP, could you describe the amazing person you are? Sure, sure. So um, as, as Ivan alluded to, uh, I got my start in real estate. So I had humble beginnings growing up and um, follow, I guess, the, the social norms of what you're supposed to do, you know, um, go to school, get good grades, get a job. So I tried that, but just realized it wasn't for me early on in my 20s. And so I worked diligently in my spare time to make myself wealthy through real estate to the point where my passive income from my rental properties rivaled my paycheck. So I say goodbye to nine to five, moved to Atlanta, uh, started a blog on YouTube, which ended up turning into a business and uh, avid networker and met Ivan as a result. We've been cool ever since. And um, now I just pretty much operate an online business. Awesome, man. Do you want to refer people to your online business? Can I mention uh, it? Sure, sure. You can check us out on YouTube. The handle is 100% finance. So that's one zero zero, the number. And then the word percent spelled out and then finance, F-I-N-A-N-C-E-D, 100% finance. Awesome. Thank you, JP. Now, the topic we're covering today, lack of financial and social equity is a thing. It's a real thing that's happening. But here's how to handle it. How how to overcome this pain that we're living in, this society of pain in this particular context. So... To jump right in, I'm going to jump into my usual articles. Um, I'm going to cover more of the financial side than the social side, and then we could jump into the CAGE abbreviation, which is complacency, atrophy, guilt, and the escape of this pain. So to start off, I was curious, does the government put a number on our heads? You know, do we have, like, is uh, Joe Biden or any other previous president put a, a dollar on my beautiful, illustrious face. So it turns out that the federal government, a uh, couple agencies have actually put a number on it. The EPA was the top one. So on their kind of off the cuff study, it wasn't really measured on anything. They, they put a, a value of statistical life at $10 million. And that was quite interesting because when I looked up the average lifetime earnings of a typical US citizen, it is $2.7 million. So we're talking about an almost 70% increase in valuation. Uh, so it's, there's kind of a big gap there. So it, it kind of is helpful to our egos to know that the government actually has a higher value on our life than what we even make in our lives. All right, so that's the financial side. The social side, I kind of wanted to talk more on the critical race theory. Uh, which is, you know, we all know, maybe some of us aren't that aware in history, you know, minorities have had a kind of a, not so much of a leg up on on social equity side. So uh, we could talk about, you know, if your your housing is not as great as another person's, your ability to be socially accepted, even to conversations that JP and I do now, um, you know, talking with make millionaires on a regular basis. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, that would not have been a reality. And so we have this kind of gap that creates a social equity difference. Uh, and that's directly tied into critical race theory. Uh, here's an example of that. Uh, so in D.C., a wealthy, mostly white neighborhood in, in D.C. has three bus stops, and one metro station, and plenty of safe, safe sidewalks for walking. In comparison, a few miles away in a different D.C. neighborhood, uh, one that is mostly minority, there are zero bus stops, unsafe sidewalks, 
and they're packed and too curvy, and the closest metro station is one mile away. So these are kind of the gaps. But let's go ahead and jump right into the CAGE acronym. Well, actually, let me pause there. Uh, JP, did you have any thoughts on that before we move on? Oh, yes. Uh, we were talking prior to the recording of this podcast about redlining and that that's the thing in, in real estate. Of course, it's illegal, but redlining is, if you can imagine having a map with a, a red ink pen, and you're just circling areas in which a certain demographic they'll, they'll be able to lend loans to in that area or not lend money towards in that area. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a thing and it's definitely frowned upon because um, it just leaves people disadvantaged where uh, acquisition of properties are concerned. Yeah. And we're talking about that was still, we're still dealing with the effects of that because literally not even a generation ago, that was a normal thing. Like, uh, there were banks that would say, oh, that's a majority black neighborhood. We're just not loaning there or the policing uh, funds are just not going there. Education funds are not going there. So we're talking about 34 years ago, that was still just happening. And so we're still unwinding that mess of legal systems in place to uh, basically disadvantage minorities and things like this. Um, uh, and what I mean by unwinding, too, I just realized this, so I'm glad you brought that up, JP, is even my wife was looking at a house up in North Georgia here, and literally a real estate agent, like the at the new home build builder office, told her, what are you doing here? Like, she just didn't belong, and clearly my wife noticed it was a majority white neighborhood. But we have these sorts of things just embedded in our psyche. And the, the sad reality is she probably didn't even think she did anything wrong. It's just embedded in her soul that, oh, I, my last three generations of families just kind of were in their own racial culture group of folks. And that's just kind of how people live. But the entire kind of summary of what we're going to cover today is also just kind of being more aware of this stuff so that we could move through it. If you're not even aware like that agent, clearly offending me and my wife, luckily I wasn't there because I would have <laughs> had some words. Like, what do you mean? Oh man, she deals with so much uh, as a strong black woman. It's, but it, I'm not gonna go off on that tangent. Let's move on. So the cage, how do we put this thing into a, a subject of, of complacency. Um, complacency, uh, I mean, uh, JP, you and I could both, I, I'm sure early on in our businesses could have seen how we were complacent in some things, right? Like maybe not making training procedures, um, not getting ahead of issues with our staff, uh, not making staff for the right book positions and stuff like this, um, but in, in this context, it's a little more difficult to identify. If I had to start with something to connect with to, it would be being complacent to not be aware and also use it as a crutch to not move forward from it. Well, what are your thoughts, Sophie? Yes, I agree. Um... There's a quote that says complacency is the enemy of greatness or the enemy to greatness. And I think oftentimes when people do reach an obstacle roadblock, roadblock such as your wife, when she um, was asked the question, what are you doing here? Some people will take that and say, you know what? They're right. What am I doing here? Let me be complacent, go back to what's comfortable and go about my life. But you got to have a level of grit and a level of tenacity to push forward in despite of those um, those obstacles that you face. Mm. That's powerful, man. Great gem to start off with. Tenacity. Yeah, because it happens often, you know, that's the thing with, with becoming successful in anything. So even though we could be touching on race, it could be other issues, it could be gender too. You know, what if um, the gentleman, assuming it was a gentleman, said that to your wife because she's a woman, 
and he might be familiar with only working with men in regard to um, properties. You know, it, maybe he noticed she had a ring on her finger and he might be saying, well, what are you doing here? Shouldn't I be talking to your husband instead? Mm-hmm. You know, it could be a gender difference in which, you know, uh, when people have those uh, biases, we as, uh, I guess, minorities, you, you just can't focus on that person's ignorance and you have to be focused on the goal at hand. And I think complacency somewhat is your is your worst enemy. And, and it's not to um, be hurt by that situation, you know, even though the gentleman who, who said that was wrong. But to say, all right, you know what? He, he just lacks understanding, but I'm not going to allow that to stop me from pushing forward towards my goal because I'm, I'm not going to allow that, ignor- that ignorance to cause me to be complacent mm-hmm. and, and, and not pursue my goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, what you m- mentioned there just really hit me because it made me think of two things. Number one, permission to be great. Number two, a slave mentality. They're kind of intertwined, but the permission to be great, I could definitely relate to immediately. Um, I had, I guess in my first couple jobs, kind of, uh, you know, bosses that just kind of skewed me away from kind of my entrepreneurial ambition. And they they were white. I I just got to be honest, of course, their majority of population, that's going to happen statistically. But... I kind of became used to that. Like, oh, he's running a business. Um, she's running a business. Another, another boss of mine was also a female, a white lady. Uh, they must know the best, and I should always heed their advice. But at some point, I didn't need their permission to be great anymore. Right? It was a kind of embedded in my psyche that, oh, they must know everything to do right. And it was nothing on them. They were just kind of being more conservative about how to run business and X, Y, Z. But it was something in me that needed to change. I need to give myself permission to be amazing, to put this beautiful face on billboards. <laughs> Which brings me to the slave mentality. My wife brought this up to me a couple of years ago as to, uh, she, she's seen this, uh, unfortunately, in her friend's sometimes growing up and uh, it's, it's the thing is genetically right we probably have some memories stuck in there that we need you know somebody to give us orders we need uh, to wait um, or severe consequences would happen and that's what kind of ties into that um, so when you're you're talking about something that genetically predisposed to being terrified of serious consequences. Uh, forget about even just slavery. We're, we're talking about right the 20s, 30s recession. Your, your parents can't give you the same advice that is needed now to become great. Do you want to add to any of that, JP? Yes, I do agree with you, uh, especially where the mindset is concerned. So, yes, you can be genetically predisposed, but also it could just be uh, social constructs or the social norm, mm-hmm. especially um, growing up in, in America where um, the school system pretty much educates you on how to be an employee, to uh, not think outside the box, don't color outside the lines. Make sure you adhere to your teachers, you know, you follow orders, you sit in your seat, you do what was told, you study to get the right answers. Don't you dare make a mistake. Don't you dare collaborate with others. That's called cheating. So I think as a result, that that pretty much uh, molds us to be ideal employees. So when you come to that situation where you're starting having thoughts about becoming an entrepreneur and you run this by your employers, uh, yeah, it makes sense that they will talk you out of it because you might have been a really great team member and they want to keep you on the, on the team as long as possible. So they don't want you to go away and do your own thing because they might have their own selfish ambitions, you know, mm-hmm. where, where your uh, livelihood is concerned and not necessarily putting your wants ahead of theirs or your career path ahead of theirs. That's true. Man, and we didn't even touch on like critical thinking skills. 
that that's belief needed in our education system, which is lacking. True. And that directly ties into financial losses, right? So if you're trained to be an employee, you're going to be like, oh, I have to start McDonald's. Here's the thing, though. There's folks that start off at 100 grand a year that I know that just had a good kind of structural system in their brain. They thought, oh, CBS needs buildings. They need plots of land to build on. I'm going to go get some land, and then I'm going to go tell them, hey, you're going to pay me 300 grand a year to find land for you. And they're just going to go sit in this executive's desk or office desk. That sounded inappropriate. In his office <laughs> to <laughs> tell him this is happening. And so there's different ways to also be an employee and win. Maybe your heart's calling is to be a heart surgeon. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the difficulty in what I think you're trying to draw out too is you're, you gotta have the, the heart to invest your time well. Maybe you're a heart surgeon, but you wanna multiply your money, right? Our education system is not going to be able to help you do that. And especially if you're a minority starting off at probably the bottom of the bottom education. Uh, yeah. Man, that just made me think of something else. Stacy, my wife, told me that when, you, uh, when she went to uh, college, there was actual courses that were missing from her high school that she had to kind of get a, a leg up on. She had to make up the difference. Her, her school, inner city, of course, didn't prepare her well enough to go to college. That's ridiculous. So that, we're not even talking about 30, 40 years ago now. We're talking about, you know, what, five, ten maybe? So let's move on. Atrophy. Atrophy. So it's so easy to just kind of rest on your laurels and let all this stuff kind of rain, rain on you, right? What is that, that SWV song? <laughs> rain on me. <laughs> I forgot the lyrics. It just do nothing, right? Just, oh, society's out to get me. Therefore, I'm just gonna stick around at McDonald's, stick around to whatever. Eh, this is good enough. What do, you, what do you do when you come across folks that are okay with the, the status quo, JP? Oh yeah, if they're okay with the status quo, let's say they're, they're complacent, uh, they, they really have to be somewhat um, disgusted with their current state in life because if you're comfortable with your current state in life, if, if it's tolerable, even though it's slightly painful, but if it's tolerable, you really have no incentive to change. You know, so I think there's a quote where it says the pain to change has to be less than the pain to stay the same. So that pain of being complacent, being OK with the status quo it has to be greater than the, the pain to actually uh, to, to make a change. So I, I think that's one issue. But with, with your atrophy, um, I think one thing that we have to understand is that to me, when I hear the word atrophy, it reminds me of development, such as working your body, right? Working out. The only time a muscle atrophies is through limited use. But the more you use it, especially if you're adding pressure to it, pain, in other words, to, to tie in your, the name of your podcast, if you're adding some pain or some pressure, that muscle will grow and develop to the point it increases your strength. So that way you can lift a heavier workload in the future. So I think in regard to wealth, what we have to do, not just as minorities, but everyone as a whole, if we're somewhat weak in a certain area, let's say you don't have the business acumen, Let's say you don't know about financing or let's say you don't know about the step by step process of how to start a business or invest in real estate, whatever it is that you want to pursue financially. If you realize you have a weakness, instead of pointing a finger at somebody else and saying that, oh, the reason why I'm weak is because this institution didn't train me properly or this person didn't give me a handout. To me, it, it removes my power because it's, it's, it's me subconsciously saying 
that my success is dependent upon this other construct, this other institution or this other person, which I, I disagree with. My success is based upon my actions. Sure, the outside world, external factors have an impact on my success, but it's a minimal impact. So what I would focus on is like the weak areas I have. Let me see how I can strengthen those areas and develop them. And that's through repetition. So if I want my biceps to grow larger, I have to repetitiously work on that muscle. Sure, it could be painful. Sure, there may be times I don't want to wake up early and go to the gym. Sore, my, mu my muscles can be sore. I don't want to overwork them, but I have to make sure I, I exercise diligence as, as well as have a high degree of self-discipline and self-control to grow that muscle. And I think that's what we're lacking. We, we think that it should be handed to us on a silver platter, success. And, and to me, that's, that's not how it is. We have to go out there and get it. If our school system didn't teach us this, like you said, your wife had to do. She had to go out there and seek that information. And that's what we have to do. So that way we don't fall victim to atrophy. Yeah. People think success is like, but it's more like, <laughs> you're right. And the, the other point to that is the more you allow this kind of thinking of blaming others or being in passivity, the more it's uh, going to be harder to pull out of it, right? Um, it's like, it's like and, and it'll be a perpetual pain, too. So it's like a, a rubber band. You're pulling with no results, but you're getting the pain. So you're right. Towards the beginning, you said the pain has to be greater. The disgust has to be greater than the gain uh, or the, the current pain uh, to move on. To, to whatever you need to do next. So, man, that, that was powerful right there by itself. So Yeah, so you're cool with a ramen noodle diet. You know, all, all, hey, the more power to you. You like eating the top ramen, top ramen, that's <laughs> perfectly fine. But it has to come to a point where you're like, I'm sick and tired of this. You just want to <laughs> just throw that stuff in the trash so you can have filet mignon or whatever floats your boat. You, yeah. you have to get to the point where you can no longer tolerate this complacent lifestyle. Yeah. You know, it's funny, the ramen inventor, he was uh, born in Japan, and he just thought of, oh, my fellow countrymen coming out of World War II are starving, and they're, you know, dying from starvation, so I got to fix this, and I got to make it really cheap. And so he decided that development process, which I'm sure took years, to make a dollar <laughs> or less, probably five cents per, right. <laughs> per cup uh, to get to that. It took a lot of pain, took, I'm sure, a lot of questioning. Like his wife was probably telling me, telling him, what, what five cents a cup? You need to get up out of here. <laughs> we have, we have uh, mouths to feed at home, but he did it. And what a, a great success story right out of, out of that. Yeah. So, that also ties into the guilt part. And you mentioned this a little earlier on too, of you got to have the disgust. You got to have guilt. It's a part of, it's a healthy part of life. If you don't have guilt about anything, you, you just literally can't move on. You're just like, well, do, 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 everything is fine and dandy in the world. Everything is fine and dandy in my life. Meanwhile, every night you go in the closet and cry to yourself, right? And that's the thing, too. We don't even cry anymore. That's not allowed. So guilt. How do we have appropriate guilt over this? Um, I think it's uh, healthy to protest. I think it's okay. But to loot and stuff, that's not really effective. I think it's more effective to join in political ranks and you know become a senator mayor, whatever it may be, to address kind of the more critical race theory, kind of the more gentrification, societal issues at, at scale through the government. But statistically, even Mark Cuban said this, the government is wildly ineffective at doing things at scale. They, even for affordable housing, like I was about to use government subsidies and, and things like this, but the bureaucracy, the paperwork, 
to get through their system, I was just like, you know what? I know how to do this with the foundational investment principles. I'm not doing that. Um, so, so what's another form of guilt to have about this matter, JP? Oh, good question. I would say some people um, may have the mindset or the belief that becoming successful financially is wrong because it, it's, it boils down to a language. So, for instance, when people, when someone's extremely wealthy or rich, they say they're filthy rich. So filthy has a negative connotation to it. And so some people may, may assume that being wealthy is, uh, is a bad thing because they might believe that in order to get rich, you have to exploit others. You have to exploit your employees. You have to take advantage over your customers. You have to be some sort of a scam artist. So you got to do um, criminal activity to get wealthy. And they're thinking, if I do those things to get wealthy, then I'm going to have a lot of guilt as a result. And so being that I'm a person of ethics, I'm a person of morals and character, I won't do those filthy things or negative things. So as a result of that, I just have to be okay with my lot in life and just be mediocre where my income's concerned. So I think what people have is just a lot of false beliefs in their heart, in their, in their uh, subconscious mind. And it's, they tell themselves that, oh, if I do these things to get wealthy, then I'm going to be guilty myself. And, and I, I can't do that. I, I can't. I don't, I, don't be, I don't want this guilt to weigh heavily on my heart. I don't want to mistreat someone else to gain a dollar. And none of those things are true, right? Some of the most successful business people out there, some of the most successful wealthy people out there, they're philanthropists. They're, they're, they're very charitable. These are the people who build hospitals. You know, if you drop down, you see a person's name on a library or on a museum or on a hospital. It's because these people donated, who knows, thousands or millions of dollars to these institutions. These people are ex extremely giving. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it and it, they don't feel guilt. They actually feel elated when they do give. So I just think that if you do feel guilty about becoming wealthy, you have to look inward to see why that is and really start rewiring the things, your subconscious mind so that you don't have that guilt when you start pursuing your, your dreams to uh, gain financial success. Yeah, I think another aspect of this could be your inner circle, friends and family. To make you feel like it's you know wrong to make lots of money, right, right. Or they feel guilty if they ask you for some money, and you say no, and oh, which you ain't looking out, man. Come on, bro. <laughs> you know why are you looking out? Trying to help a brother out, and you shouldn't have to feel guilty either because you can share the same knowledge that you have with them to help build them up. Because the first thing is the education, is the mindset. You know, like they say, it's better to teach a man how to fish than to give him a fish. So don't don't let them make you feel guilty because you're trying to teach them to fish instead of just giving them a fish. Why did you say teach a man? You trying to be sexist, JP? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So how about a creature? <laughs> so anyone who's trying to get a fish, whether it's a man, a woman, a, a dog, teach a you got to teach them. Organism. Right. <laughs> all right. So we got. It. I think we got through guilt. Did we cover most of the financial and societal aspects of guilt? Um, I, I think the, the societal aspect could be uh, also enwrapped. Or, yeah, I think enwrapped is a word. And having empathy for our fellow brothers and sisters. So it kind of hurts me when I see somebody say, oh, these protesters are messing everything up. Or... Why is XYZ doing this to try to uh, build publicity for their civil rights organization? And I'm just like, dude, we need the kitchen sink and everything at this. I, I personally have attended rallies against KKK, you know, celebrating their whatever anniversary at the Stone Mountain, Georgia. And, you know, the more people we have supporting the advancement of society and our unity, the better we will be. The thing is, our our companies, our big corporations now, they're not, you know, brave. We're not the home of the brave as of late. You know, we have, not to disrespect Elon Musk, 
you know, he's South African, but we don't, we haven't seen an American do something amazing since probably what Bill Gates or something. Uh, so we got to, as a society, decide, hey, for us to move forward together, we got to care about our own people, but also immigrants moving here so that we can have more Elon Musk's <laughs> sending space rockets and stuff out. Because NASA itself hasn't even set it in probably a decade. So there was one last point I wanted to, that you touched on, but it, it just left my head, JP. I'm going to blame it on you. <laughs> in terms of guilt. Um, now you're trying to put the guilt on me now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, do you want to touch on societal guilt? And maybe I'll remember. <laughs> uh, no, I, actually, I don't know where you were going with that, with the societal guilt. Okay. Like the ability to look back at our country's history and breathe. That's kind of where I'm kind of go to it. Like it's a healthy thing to grieve about it as opposed to sweep it under the rug, pull it out of our history books like the critical race theory kind of agenda is doing. Um, just kind of, uh, well, if I don't look at it, if I just have tunnel vision, everything will be fine. <laughs> like you can't move on as a society to by just ignoring something. You know, it's like uh, stealing your wife's food and just kind of uh, or during lunch and then during dinner saying, oh, you, your food got taken? I, I don't know anything about that. Good luck figuring that out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's similar to credit repair. I know I was like that where I didn't want to take a look at it. You know, like you said, tunnel vision. You know, well, how can I, how can I buy real estate and get mortgages with my bad credit? I was afraid to take a look at my credit report. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I had to face the truth. I got to take a look at it. So to your point, yeah, you got to face the truth. You got to see the truth in in our history and come to peace with it or, or get a better understanding of it and then progress forward to see how, even with those disadvantages, how can you still make your disadvantages your advantage? Your advantage? Mm -hmm. Indeed. To wrap up this gift part, I just remembered, you know, and during the George Floyd thing, there was a, maybe a whole week of like 70 plus year old white uh, people probably came out in droves from retirement homes and they just held the sign and like every corner, just about every major intersection of downtown Atlanta. And they just sat there and just were waving at people. Some were standing and I was like, whoa, the generation from two generations ago, like really old people, old white people, are more aware than people in my own age group. And they're wanting to have empathy and grieve with us. And so that was really powerful to me. I said, I want to high five all of them virtually. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the escape. How do we escape this financial and societal like gaps, equity gaps? I think uh, it largely has to do with deciding to start businesses or invest well. Because uh, especially for, uh, we all know this, black people have a 400 year, you know, leg down. So they got to kind of get a heads up on that by buying more properties, by investing well, investing better. Uh, but I'm not going to even discount, you know, there's, I'm sure, a lot of other minority groups and white people that are even uh, in disadvantaged states due to whatever amount of reasons. So it has to, we have to collectively decide as home of the brave to move on, to have empathy, to grieve, but to move on. And that's kind of my kind of escape plan suggestion. What's yours, JP? Uh, sure, those are good points. Uh, I will add that to escape your current lot in life, let's say you're um, not satisfied where you're at and you're, you're tired of being complacent, I will say to, to incorporate that, that last letter in the acronym ESCAPE would be to, um, how can I say it? Well, I watched this YouTube video and I forgot the guy's name. 
Otherwise, I'd give him credit. But he, he was sharing about how we have to escape what we think uh, what wolf or society is. So let me explain this way. He was saying how people will say, well, I'm not going to talk white to get a job. Hmm. Or I'm not going to dress white when I become a business person. You know, I am who I am. I'm from this area, from this neighborhood and so forth. So I'm not going to change who I am to increase my finances, you know, increase my income. And what he was saying was basically, why do we associate business attire, that dress, as, quote unquote, dressing white? Hmm. And then you wonder why, as a demographic, I used to work for the Census Bureau. We used to gather statistics on the economy. And one of the surveys I worked on was called SIP, Survey of Income and Program Participation. And we learned about people's income. And for our white counterparts, their average net worth was $70,000, 70K. For uh, Hispanics, it was 9,800, the average net worth. And for black Americans, it was 7,500. $7,500. So the average net worth of a white American was 10 times that of a black American. And the reason I bring that stat up and it tied into this YouTuber guy who was talking is that we equate these things as being white, but white people as a demographic, they're tend to be more successful is because they do certain things. They communicate in a certain way, right? They don't call each other other derogatory terms. And they dress a certain a certain way and they speak a certain language without, um, you know, ebonics or so forth. They carry themselves in a certain way because that is the byproduct of success. And, it's, it, and we have to change that. We, we have to change our language and we have to change our appearance and not just thinking, well, I'm not going to change who I am because that means I'm not keeping it real. That means I'm being somebody else. I'm being phony. I'm being two-faced. That's not the case. I remember my mom told me when I was a young man, a teenager, I want to get my first job. And uh, she was like, you'll never get a job unless you do the following. you got to get your hair cut. I had my hair all, like, twisted up. And, you know, not saying nothing's against that. Don't get me wrong. Nothing's against that. I'm not throwing shade, shade on anyone. But my mom was like, hey, what you got to do is get a clean cut. And you're going to these job offers wearing baggy jeans or you're wearing shorts or whatever your shirt's not tucked in you got to get a button down shirt with some slacks or khakis tuck the shirt in wear a belt and wear some decent shoes no sneakers she's like you, you dress that way i guarantee you'll get a job and my friends and i we were all like applying for jobs at the same time we were all 15 16 years old and I was the first one to get a job. I got hired on the spot. I was working that same day directly after the interview because of my parents. And I think that's what we have to we have to change. We have to escape what we think success is. And we, we correlate, oh, I have to change who I am uh, physically as well as verbally how I speak to get wealth. And I think I'll be a sellout if I do. No, that's not the case. If you want to get to that next level, in life, there's sacrifice. That's like one of my mottos. For every new level of success requires a new level of sacrifice. And so if you have to sacrifice your vernacular, if you have to sacrifice your address, your appearance, if you have to sacrifice even some of your associations to people you hang around who are talking about things that do not equate to wealth, you have to make those short-term or even long-term sacrifices to get to the next level. Totally agree, brother makes me think of a situation where it wasn't even necessarily a white person, but uh, this guy I knew, a black guy, uh, ran multiple companies. Uh, we were hanging out at his house, you know, talking business, and uh, this guy walks in. It's like a contractor referred him to do some work at this house for him, and the dude was all up in baggy clothes, and this friend of mine, he just let him have it. He said, what the hell are you doing in my house? You don't show up like that in my house. <laughs> I, was no. like, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and it's true. And people say, no, don't judge a book by its cover. Why do people say that? Because everyone does. Yeah. First impressions are important. I remember um, 
uh, I was with my a good friend of mine. Um, I was recording my audiobook, and uh, he had to he had pretty much had a studio in his backpack. He was he's a music producer, but he has equipment in his backpack that he can set up shop anywhere as long as it's soundproof. So that's what we did actually. So we went to his brother's business. He was an insurance broker. He had several employees. Had an office in, in College Park. So I, I um, arrived there in the parking lot, and I see um, a Bentley outside. This is Brothers. So we go to record, and as we're done recording a chapter in my audiobook, my friend said, hey, man, have you ever rode in a foreign car before? And I said, no. He's like, hey, man, you should go ask my brother for a ride. I said, man, I'm not trying to ask him for a ride, man. I, I don't care about all that stuff. You know, I'm going to feel like no groupie. <laughs> you know? I'm just here because you just chose a location to record my, my audiobook. I'm not here to... Uh, take a joy ride in your brother's car. He's like, man, just do it, man. Just, just, just experience it. So I go into his office. His name is Doug. And I was like, hey, what's up, Doug? He said, hey, what's going on? He's like, yeah, man, I was just talking to your brother. And uh, I was wondering if you can give me a ride around the block in your, in your car. And he said, man, have a seat. I'm like, okay. So I sat down and he goes to, you know, he has a big office. He goes to his liquor cabinet and he just pours himself a glass. They even offer me one. Just pours himself a glass, <laughs> sit, taking a sip. He's like, Juan, let me ask you something. He's like, you're in real estate, right? Yeah. You're, I hear you over there. You're recording an audio book, right? Yeah. And you you raise capital. You know, you want people to invest with you and all that stuff. Yeah. And you, you do public speaking too, right? Podcasts, all that stuff. I'm like, yeah. What's your point? He's like, my point is. Why are you driving that piece of crap Mercedes Benz out there? I said, that's a piece of crap to you? He's like, yeah, why are you driving that crap? He's like, and why are you dressing in a, in a t-shirt and jeans? And I'm like, what does this have to do with me asking you for a ride? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, where, where's your angle here? Where are you getting at? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, huh? Like, this turned to a lecture? <laughs> and so he, he's like, he's like, listen, man. When I was an insurance agent before I owned my own insurance company, I had to understand and learn and perfect every sales technique in the book. I mean, I had to think of every objection, every counter, rebuttal. I had to memorize it all to get a sale. I had to work day and night to get a sale. But now, when I pull up in my Ashton Martin, again, he had a Bentley outside. He also has an Ashton Martin. He has seven cars. He said, but now when I pull my Ashton Martin, you think we're talking about the, the contract? He's like, no, we're talking about the Braves. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, sign here, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what he basically was sharing with me is this. He said, in order to break, break through barriers and start playing a game where um, people that look like him didn't play, because there was, wasn't too many minorities who actually owned insurance companies. He was um, one of the few. He said in order to break those barriers and play a game with, with other, um, I guess, white people, he said he had to look the part. He said he had to get what he's called coin success factors. And he said, man, I had to spend money to buy a certain watch, certain set of clothes, shoes, belt, car, so that way – I had the the symbols of success. He said, is it shallow? Yes, it is shallow. He's like, well, I'm just playing the game. He's like, so what I recommend you to do, Juan, since I am, and listen to what you're saying and so forth, but will greatly help your career if you start changing the way you dress. You need to have a certain level, a certain car, a certain watch, a certain belt, a certain shoes, and this dude actually helped me uh, create a list of success symbols, as he called it, to incorporate into my, my, my wardrobe. And then once I started doing that, Ivan, it, it was crazy. I, I hosted an event and we had so many people sign up for the event simply because myself and the team, we dressed apart. And then we actually had people who were there, attendees, that said, hey, I know on YouTube, you're typically wearing a t-shirt and jeans, which is fine. But when I saw you guys dressed professionally at this event, I took you guys seriously. And as a result, I didn't even really care about well, what about this and what about that? He's like, man, where do I sign? Because you guys look the part. You guys look professional. Yeah. That's why you even got that parakeet on your shoulder, right? <laughs> right. Clean wealth. You've got a trained parakeet. Now. 
The parakeet actually says sign here now. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sign here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely true, man. I, I would just to add to that, I would also say, you know, there's matters like you and I right now. We're having a casual conversation. It's okay to be the shirt. But like, you know, I'm about to raise $20 million in, in the coming weeks. I'm going to be dressed to, to the park. So the different environments have that effect too. I don't think we're both saying when you get out of your your bed, you should be in a full tux, just ready to attack anybody. So that I think wraps up escape. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground, brother. Uh, is there any last thoughts you wanted to share or questions that we could cover? Yeah, guys, just don't think that you're you're selling out because you're evolving as a person. Right. I, I used to have certain characteristics about myself, but as I sort of associated myself um, or exposed myself to other people who were successful and I started observing their characteristics, how they spoke, how they carried themselves, their mindset, the way they thought about things. I had to challenge my own mindset and thoughts and belief systems and my apparel. I had to, I had to really challenge myself and say, well. I, you know, maybe this one small thing about myself is holding me back from where I want to go. So do am I truly a sellout by making this one small change to myself? At the end of the day, does it really hurt me to dress better? At the end of the day, does it really hurt me to properly pronounce my words and, and not use profanity? At the end of the day, does it really hurt me not to hang out with people I used to hang out with and getting drunk and smoking weed? And I'm, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of health now. Is that, is that really hurting me or is it actually elevating me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it, you know, that's the mindset that we have to shift in order to, to help get to that next level. Because um, I, I was asking my, um, my fiance this question we were driving yesterday. And while I was driving, I asked her to, to search up something for me. I said, hey, you know, can you do me a favor? Can you see, like, if, if student athletes are more likely to make more income as adults than those who didn't participate in a, in a team sport in school? And she searched it up and was like, yeah, they make, I forgot the percentage, whether it was 30-something percent more income than those who don't. He said, but the thing about this stat is they're not sure if being a student athlete helps you make more money. Or it's because people who are student athletes, they typically have those characteristics first. Meaning, for a student athlete, you have to go to school, you have to work out, do practice, you have to play in a game. So you have long commuting times. You know, the game might end at eight or nine o'clock. You still have an hour drive because you might be competing against a school that's, that's out of town. Plus, you still got homework to do. Plus, you got tutoring to do. Mm-hmm. So you're making a ton of sacrifices. So their, their argument is they're not sure that becoming a student, I mean, becoming a student athlete helped you incorporate these great characteristics of self-control, self-discipline, or if you already had those attributes before you became a student athlete, that's the reason why you want to become a student athlete. So to me, it's the same thing with, with wealth. Most people say, well, this person got wealthy because, you know, they were in the right place at the right time. They got lucky or they had a rich uncle. Sure, those things play a part. You know, there are some external factors that affect your success, but is it really because they are they have the right characteristics first? They're self-controlled, they're self-disciplined, they, they have a high level of tenacity, they mm-hmm. make sure they get their mind right, they're always training their mindset, they're associating with the right people, they're speaking the right way, they're dressing the right way. So if you're not at that place where you want to be financially, start first by incorporating those attributes, and then I think you'll you'll start going somewhere. I done gave up so much free time, knowing time ain't free. I sacrificed it. She knows I make sacrifices, and if it's real, real love, then you make sacrifices. To get ahead, man, you got to make sacrifices. That how that's how hungry my appetite is. Big Sean just released those. Big Sean, yeah. That's I knew it was a rapper. I want to say Lil Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite songs by Big Sean uh, called Sacrifices. Uh, it's true. So on the path to greatness, we also, to your point, um, it's not always going to be sunshine and roses, right? 
you're not going to short be able to shortcut to the Bentley, to Aston Martin. <clears throat> you and I both on the path to purchasing our first couple of properties. I know you define this too. Eight ramen. What we described towards the beginning was we scrounged up all the money we could to buy more and more. So there's there's things we got to do to get to the next level. Uh, one thing specifically I could point, pinpoint on my path to leaving my job was I decided I'm not going to spend more money on my muscle car. I had a 1980 Corvette kind of last uh, few years. Um, I ended up selling it for another car. But anyways, the point is I measured, oh, I spent a whole lot of money on this damn car that is always broken. <laughs> it's always causing me stress. It, it's been on a total of 15 tow trucks before I sold it. Uh, so there's- Are you we, serious? Yeah, there's things we have in our lives that we just need to describe. This is not going to assist me on my uh, path forward. And that's one of the things, right? It, even in American culture, it's celebrated to have all these nice things to show off. But that was something I diminished down on my path to leaving my job because I was like, this is not getting a new return on investment uh, quantitatively. So I'm going to just kill it. So I just stopped spending money on it um, and bought more properties with the, with the difference. All right. We just covered a lot. JP, I am forever grateful to you, man, because you could be doing a lot more of the stuff. I know you have hundreds of clients, hundreds of students. So thank you for taking out this time to spend with me and whoever is watching, all 2.5 of those people. The, the 0.5 is a creature somewhere. <laughs> you said 2.5, I was thinking 2.5 million, but you're talking about 2.5 people. <laughs> <laughs> it's my mom and your mom, JP. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyways, man. Thank you so much. Have an amazing day, bro. You too, man. It was great. Thanks.